or I should say I am reviewing the season three episode Legacy. Uh, this episode was Tyrell Wellick heavy centric, something that we were promised, I guess you can say. And it was giving us a little bit of insight about what happened during the time period that uh, Tyrell Wellick was no longer, or should I say, wasn't that frequent on season two. Kind of filling in the gaps of not only his character, but also giving us a lot of confirmations about some of the theories or some of the hints the show has given us about other characters um, as well. It was a very um, emotional, introspective episode. Uh, I would say more emotional, I would think, than say the revelation during season one of uh, Mr. Robot not being real and being something that was in Heliot's head. And in season two, I would say more emotional than when uh, Cisco. It was obvious that Cisco, or at least the tension, Cisco was being killed. That whole episode in itself. Uh, the show is still keeping up with the, the horror-esque theme of the season. In this case, it's the person alone in the woods, if you will. Um, and the kind of like the psychological breakdown that isolation does to somebody. It also gives kind of like some hints to Tyra Wellick, like his motivations and his purpose on the show. Um, I really enjoyed the episode. I had to watch it like three times to kind of see if I absorbed everything, trying to see like what exactly the show was trying to tell us with this episode. I think I caught most of it, but I'm sure um, I'll be missing things. Um, I'm sure there are things in this episode that will um, add layers to other additional episodes on. And um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I think so far it's like the best of this season so far. And um, so let's kind of get into it. I'm going to kind of start with a confirmation. So I'm going to be kind of jumping around here. Um, this episode confirmed what many people have suspected since the beginning of season two, that Santiago is an agent of the Dark Army. Uh, we saw that when uh, Tyra Wellick decided to take a walk and escape his location, escape from the Dark Army. And he was picked up by a local yokel, um, uh, <laughs> which is very funny. It's like... Oh, he did all the wrong things to get picked up. Like he, instead of just, if he had just simply owned that he was there and just kind of walked back, back past the police officer, I don't think the police officer would have been suspicious of him. But instead, he was like, he like doubled down on his like disguise, if you will, and tried to walk cool away. Like, yeah, I'm not a wanted man. Don't look at me. And that, of course, raised further red flags. And then the officer. Um, did a doop doop and Tyra Wellick um, decided to run. He eventually ended up getting caught. Um, the uh, local person, uh, the police officer, called the FBI directly instead of calling it in, which is um, good for Tyra Wellick because it placed him in um, FBI custody. Um, the guy was kind of dumb, I can, you can say, like he was given like a remote location, GPS location to pick up Tyra Wellick instead of just taking him straight to jail. I can understand why he would want to do that because he wants to, um, as he tells Tyra Wallach, no one's going to believe that he caught the most wanted man, take a selfie with him. Um, he wanted the fame and the fortune, you know, the promotion and all that um, that could entail with the capture of Tyra Wallach, which is, you know, an interesting aspect of how the show uses, uh, I don't want to say social engineering, but, you know, the greed of people to push them in the direction that they need to. And, of course, um, uh, SUV pulled up, um, the, the local Yoko was at the location, and it was Santiago that greeted him and shot him in the face. We saw that revelation when he opened the door and um, brought Tyra Wallet back to the cabin where Irvin was waiting, and you saw Santiago basically yelling at uh, Irvin, explaining how if he hadn't um, put a blanket out to where he was the only person again, receiving the leads about any possible sightings of Tyra Wellick as a monitoring of the situation um, or the, and the fact that the local Yoko never called it in that they would all have been you know the ship would have been pooped if you will and you know he also reveals something that um, was pretty, pretty much heavily hinted that people are disposable to the Dark Army um, once you serve your purpose they have no use for you it was kind of hinted by White Rose when she stated um, in the episode one that once Elliot was done, they can get rid of him, basically. Um, it's hinted again when it comes to Cisco, and we'll talk about Cisco, um, that he, you know, his situation. And so 
there was some clarity there on that. And so now that we know for officially for sure that Santiago is an agent of the Dark Army, it makes me wonder exactly that second team is supposed to be hunting the Dark Army is actually doing. Um, are there other FBI agents that are assisting Santiago within the FBI to track um, the movements of not only Dom but uh, F Society members, at least monitoring the, um, the Darlene situation? It's obvious that Dark Army knows that Darlene has snitched, which doesn't bode well for her. Uh, maybe her protection that she has has been lifted, and we'll talk about that when we talk about Cisco. But with that, you know, confirmation and revelation, that was very, very fascinating to me that they actually did that so early um, in this season. And uh, I think it will pretty much color all his actions from further on out. I don't think Dom is safe this season. I don't see her surviving with, a, with an insider like Santiago with his position. What she stated is very precarious with him surviving the shootout where people are suspicious you know, within the agency that somehow he was up in the room when the, the shooting was occurring, how did that happen? So he has suspicion on him. Um, two, with the hack happening, like a series of like basically fuck ups. And in the FBI, you know, when you get suspicious, suspicion fall upon him as Santiago stated to uh, Irvin, then things aren't gonna go well. They're gonna either put him off the case or lock him up or something like that. And he didn't actually need this Tyra Welk situation. And he called them a weirdo as he was leaving, which I thought was very amusing. Um, another thing about that was that Tyra Welk, like, it took him a while, but he was trying to break his thumb and he successfully broke his thumb to remove his handcuffs. And he was trying to escape, but wasn't successful, I can say, because he was locked in the back. Um, I thought that was very fascinating, very interesting, the, his commitment, I guess you can say, to survive, that he's willing to do that to himself. Most people aren't willing to do so. Um, what else? Oh, the other confirmation is the fact that, you know, as we were talking about how people are disposable for the Dark Army, that Cisco was disposable. Um, he was given the phantom cell by Darlene. They had met up. Um, and it wasn't Cisco that actually um, put the firmware or did, did anything. He handed it off to the Dark Army. And the Dark Army um, took it. And as he was meeting up with the Dark Army, he met up with Irvin. Irvin was telling him that Darlene was a job. So it kind of hinted the fact that the reason that Cisco and Darlene even have a relationship is because Cisco inserted himself into Darlene's life to, as a way to, for um, Dark Army to monitor the inside workings of F Society by using Darlene. Um, Irvin stated that, you know, she's a job, stop caring. He's disposable. She, She's protected, and that freaks Cisco out. Um, he kind of knew what that meant. Um, he already kind of got a little uppity with them, as we saw last season, um, when he talked about the Phantom Cell and how it was late in coming. Um, and now we also finally learned like who actually programmed the Phantom Cell, and that was um, Tyrell Wellick. And he noticed that there was another malware, which is what the, the malware that uh, Elliot inserted or I should say Mr. Robot, well, it actually was Elliot inserted to own the FBI phones. So, and that apparently wasn't really part of the plan, so it, it hints that Tyra Wellick is not really completely on board with the whole stage two um, mapping out and stuff, and he's really frustrated because he's been kept away from Elliot for so long. Um, as he's basically, he and Elliot are the architects of stage two. So I found that very fascinating. We find out exactly the true nature of the purpose of the Phantom Cell, which is already hinted at, but we kind of got confirmation that we had a dual purpose, the back door for E Corp, which was programmed by Elliot and Tyra Wellick, primarily by Tyra Wellick and the owning of the FBI cell phones. What else? Um, oh, Frank. Frank, the um, voice that we've been hearing in the background, and he did the interview of Joanne Wellick, which was very suspicious to me and suspicious by a lot of people that when he interviewed Joanne Wellick, he never mentioned the fact that uh, he is the most wanted man in the world for the hack. And that kind of bothered people that there was such an emphasis on her part of getting the murder charges dropped that she wasn't so worried about the hack as much, which makes me think that maybe she might have been also Dark Army as well. The, the hack thing might have been resolved in itself. Maybe they have a different Patsy, which was hinted at um, in the meeting between Frank and um, White Rose. Um, White Rose had summoned Frank and basically stated that he was to one, uh, massage Tyra Wellick's image to be like kind of a good guy. 
um, which explains the Joanna Wellick interview and some of the background um, that voices and stuff in season two about Daryl Wellick. Then he was also supposed to help place the blame of F society, like the origins, like the backing in Iran. So moving it away from like the China angle and Dark Army um, and just being like a bunch of hacker goofs, but really like a, a state agency attack and put it, placed it on Iran which would direct more of a mid-eastern conflict if things go sideways, I guess. Um, the other thing was uh, they showed in the background, like, Trump giving one of his speeches, that he wanted, uh, White Rose wanted Frank to support Trump to get him elected. And Frank was like, this guy's a moron, he's an idiot, why, why would you want that? He, there's no way to control him. And White Rose was like, there's, everyone basically has strings, and he, he, he's figured out a way, I guess, to puppet Trump's strings. Um, <clears throat> which is very fascinating and it just shows the the, the depth and the um, power that the Dark Army has and I guess considering that they're backed by China and that they have all these resources where they're literally basically everywhere. They're in the FBI, they're in the media, um, they're able to get into different agencies. They don't have absolute control. Irvin kind of hinted that to Tyra Wellick when they get back to the city to meet up with Elliot for the reunion. Um, that if Tyrell shows his face, then um, they have no control. If he gets caught, they can't protect him. Um, also, the fact that they basically, I would say, they had like a, almost like a pop-up hotel for the purpose of the meetup. Like they, I don't know if there's, a, I know there's, in New York, there's a lot of like smaller hotels. They're like private high-end hotels where you have to either be a member or they're very exclusive in their pricing where they price people out to where you have to basically have to know how to get into there. And it seemed like this place that Tara Wellick and when we get into the story was put up seems like that type of place. But also can be, it seemed to me like fairly new, fairly clean, like a pop-up hotel, which demonstrates again their, the, the level of resources and access and money and funds that Dark Army has where they're able to operate in such a fashion in, in the city of New York without anyone being really well aware of it. Um, that the Red Wheelbarrow was Elliot's idea, the code name for the Stage 2 project, which makes me think again that maybe the barbecue place might have been something that they helped design or create um, for the purpose as a cover for their operation, like the basement or at least the location of that restaurant is so close to the Stage 2 location, the blowing up of the E Corp building, and that they use that name <laughs> for their barbecue place, this restaurant that. Um, that's in universe, if you will. Um, that might just have one location. It might be just that location. Um, I didn't really get a close look at the menu the first time around. I'm trying to get screenshots to see if there's other locations. But given there was a grand opening that it survived the blackout, it might be like the one and only location. And its whole purpose of existence is to, as a cover for their operatives to operate in that area. Uh, what other confirmations did we get? Um... Hmm. Um, oh, Angela telling Tyrell Wellick. So Angela was there when, um, after Elliot got shot, um, was there as he was being operated on by the Dark Army, that she was there when he woke up, and she knows, again, there's another confirmation about Mr. Robot, so the extent of her knowledge of Mr. Robot, and she hinted to Tyrell Wellick, she told him that Elliot can indeed be somebody else so he's the only other person that kind of sort of knows it but she didn't directly say there's another personality and I think when we see that last shot and I'll go into detail, detail when we talk Tyra Welk you kind of see the hint where he's trying to piece it all together um, but just kind of confirms like again Angela's placement within this plan for stage two and she's Elliot's handler to make sure that Elliot and Mr. Robot are basically um, one, not in conflict with one another, one another, and two, the stage two is going to still continue forward. Um, those are the other like kind of side character stories there. Um, didn't see anything else. Uh, oh, a little tidbit. Um, and I might say that for when I talk about um, the special episode this week about the three personalities of Elliot kind of revisiting that theory about White Rose. While White Rose does have the backing of China, um, controls the Dark Army, I think that she might be overplaying her hand with the whole fact that 
Um, she still wants stage two to go, even if she gets the Congo vote, and basically precipitate a war happening. Um, they've really been emphasizing this, um, start as an insulary character, her right-hand person, as a um, an individual that's she's leaning on to get things done. And they talked about how she wanted him to speak, start speaking English because he's having um, more duties um, in this area. And he wasn't so set on stage two, you know, actually enacting it. And I think, I don't think his loyalties are completely with White Rose. I think his loyalties might be with, with the overall structure of Dark Army or the overall structure of China. He's already hinted in the fact that he, he doesn't like Tyra Wellick or Elliot because they're unstable. Um, and his placement in his infrastructure, there might be a power play move that might be, they may, may be building up or hinting at, or a confrontation with the fact that White Rose might be unseated because of her desire to continue with stage two, even um, if the Congo vote doesn't quite go their way. I'm thinking the Congo vote is going to go their way, but um, there, there wouldn't be a need for war, if you will. It doesn't do anyone any good if there's a all-out World War III occurring. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, pretty much like three-fourths of this episode, I remember saying almost like 90%, is basically about Tyra Wellick. And it, going scene by scene here, it, the, the show opens up with um, the night of the hack again. We kind of see Tyra Wellick at um, the computer um, in the fun house with Elliot. Um, Elliot shows him what's going on. Tyra Wellick's sitting. Elliot actually goes into the popcorn machine, picks up the gun, and he switches from Elliot to Mr. Robot, or at least we're seeing that as the audience. Uh, I kind of like that, where they're, they're hinting and showing um, more Christian Slater and like kind of flipping uh, the perspectives of, you know, we know it's Elliot, but this Mr. Robot personality. And um, he picks up the gun to kill Tyra Wellick. I think the motivation was just to kind of get rid of him because as Mr. Robot argued with Tyra Wellick, he inserted himself, he forced himself into this situation. He's not really part of the plan. And so as he was about to kill Tyra Wellick, um, Tyra Wellick gets up, he's trying to plead for his life, he holds up his hands, and then we have our Pulp Fiction, Pulp Fiction moment. And there will be a review, not this week, but next week of that um, film. I actually watched it again over the weekend because of this episode and I'll do my review and, and my my take on that some of the things that might be um, either whether they're just odes or hints of, of influence if you will that might be just particularly this season or just the series as a whole but he holds his hands out and there's a misfire and it's what's called a squid if you're unfamiliar with um, guns um, sometimes the bullets if they're not properly manufactured correctly um, whether it be the power, the powder within the the bullet itself, like in the casing, there's the powder and stuff, and then you have the actual bullet that's the projectile. So you, the gun hits the casing, which the powder unites and pushes out the bullet, and that's why the the casing spits out, depending on what type of gun you have. Um, if that's not done correctly, if it's improperly manufactured, you could, in essence, have the misfire that we saw on the show or you can have something worse if it's like really badly done the gun itself can blow up in people's hands and it's been known to happen it's very rare i mean manufacturing um guns and bullets have been done for centuries now they got it down to pretty much a perfect science but bad things happen if you um don't store your bullets properly or again if there's a manufacturer malfunction or if you place a gun in a hot um <clears throat> you know, popcorn machine, and it heats the um, gun, and it thus heats the bullets. I mean, not enough to make them um, fire, but enough to cause them to, to either um, warp the bullets, or I want to say probably not hot enough to warp the uh, gun itself, but it could warp other parts within the gun. Um, as Irvin would tell Tyra Wellick, you know, <laughs> uh, he was very lucky that was, he told him it was a squid bullet when he um, gives the gun back to Tyra Wellick. And I know I'm kind of jumping around here, um, but also that if another bullet had fired, they would easily have exploded the gun. So he was very, very lucky, you know, he wasn't killed. Um, and Elliot was very lucky he didn't lose his hand and died. Um, because, you know, even if his hand had gone, you know, the, the gun itself could have fractured to different pieces. It would have been a projectile, so it could have got him, could have got Tyra Wellick. 
Uh, it would have been very bad for the both of them. But, um, so Tyra Wellock, you know, he survives that, and he sees it as a sign from God, which is very much like um, from Pulp Fiction, where um, Samuel L. Jackson's character, Julius, since I watched that the movie again, I remember his name now, Julius, um, when he was in the room trying to get Marcel Wallace's suitcase back, and he gets uh, almost fired upon and almost killed him, and um, John Travolta's character, uh, Vince Vega, um, and the guy comes out with a hand cannon and fires, empties out his gun, and none of the bullets hit them, and he takes it as a sign of a, you know, he needs to retire and take an, another direction in life. Um, and we'll talk about that during the review. Um, it was kind of like that, where, you know, mysterious force, you know, God intervened, and Mr. Robot's like, you're freaking Looney Tune, Looney, you're crazy, and Tyrell well, like, no, this is a sign, we're supposed to work together, we're supposed to be together. And he, you know, he's pleading his case. He says, I know you know that this this hack is not the only way to take E Corp. They'll just rebuild their stuff. I'm your inside guide. I know how that works. I know who, who will be part of the recovery plan. I know how we can, you know, I know there's another plan. And you can see the inner workings of Mr. Robot. I mean, he knows that Tyra Wallach is crazy. He doesn't like Tyra Wallach as part of this plan. He's asserting himself. But he sees him as a potential tool. And the fact that, you know, Tyrell is very smart, that he was able to really figure this out, more so than even his, um, you know, Darlene or his F Society cohorts, they didn't think about, like, the next step. And so he's he's going to use Tyrell Wellick, and they're, they're sitting down figuring out how to do stage two. And because Tyrell Wellick has the inside knowledge, he knows where, like, all the, the records are stored at, how they would go about doing it, who to target, and allow them to figure out how to make stage two work. And that is when, you know, Irvin shows up. So Irvin shows up, and there, obviously, um, it, it demonstrates that, you know, Elliot was right that people were following him. You know, Men in Mysterious Black, and it's um, the Dark Army. Now, he saw them as different people. Maybe they've been, some of it might have been a figment of his imagination, but some of it is, like, his mind sees or understands what's going on, which makes me wonder if they'll show a flashback of him, um being watched by the Dark Army, and because um, Mr. Robot can see what Elliot sees, and Elliot doesn't want to know everything that's going on, um, his memory being manipulated a little bit by himself, to, instead of seeing you know Dark Army members, he's seen two different, completely different sets of people, and it would be interesting if they show that. So these two guys have been following Elliot, um, they know he's in the arcade, he's there with the Swede, and so, as Irvin calls <laughs> Tyrell, so they go in there, and um, you know Elliot is surprised by this. He knows who they are, Dark Army and stuff. Um, Tyrell doesn't know who they are, and he goes, you know, Irvin goes, you know, you know why I'm here, right? And they're like looking at each other. He goes, you know, you fucked up, you fucked up big time, boys. And he basically says, you know, you're Tyrell Wellick. You have your quick card, keys to your car. Give them to me. Give me the phone. Um, Tyrell is looking to Elliot, Elliot like nods, he gives up his phone, he gives up his keys, he goes, you know, when you see me, it means you fucked up, it means things are wrong, you got offside. And then he explains that what happened was that whoever Tyrell Wellick with inside E Corp told him to um, deactivate the honeypot, that Gideon, you know, call, he got a call and called it in, called it into the FBI that the honeypot was, um, deactivated by the orders of Tyra Wellick, and Tyra Wellick is about to be the most wanted person in the world. And so because of that attachment, that means that things of the plan, like that nobody was supposed to be known from this. Um, it's going to make things go sideways, potentially. And um, that he needs to go with them. That, you know, Tyra wouldn't survive without the help of the Dark Army. And Elliot nods his head and says, yes. Tyra Wellick's car, um, we know, is get, being given to him by Irvin, and it's his responsibility to go to the, that parking lot location and drop off the car, which makes me think that this is where the tie-in, I think, is that Joanne is aware that that is a Dark Army parking lot, I guess, and about the uh, parking lot attendant and manipulating him. Um, she's successful in doing that. Um, I don't know why she's so fixated in getting her husband off. Maybe that's part of the plan to where Tyra Wellick is not the real patsy in all of this. Maybe that was a 
you know, a plan, if you will, to kind of maybe discredit the FBI in some regard. Excuse me, I'm not quite certain or sure. But he goes with Irvin. And Irvin takes him to an isolated location with a house which the Dark Army owns. And they own the other 37 acres around it. And he tried to tell Tyrell Wellick, but I think Tyrell Wellick never believed it, that there's motion sensors and things of that nature around the house. So they know that um, if he tries or attempts to leave, that they would know. Could be there. But given the fact that he was able to get away so quickly, and it's an indication that um, that's probably not true. So Tyra Wellick is in this um, house and he's, he's, you know, he wants to know why he's there, um, what his purpose is and stuff. And he's like, you know, he and Elliot need to work on the, the plan, work on everything. And Irvin is like telling him, you know, you need to stay here and um, that he will let, if he needs to contact his wife, they can make those arrangements. Tyra was like, no, I and no contact. Um, she can't be part of this. Um, until it's basically done. Um, he does get like a baby cam. They give him a baby cam later on. And he watches his son and stuff. So you know his attachment. And he's also, when he eventually gets internet access, he's seeing all the stories about his wife. And he gets kind of a little upset by the fact of some of the tabloid stories about, you know, she's stepping out, um, getting a divorce, which is true. And so he gets to get upset. He's very, you know, he wants to be with his wife again. Um... They have a very bizarre, interesting relationship, but it's obvious that he's in love or still very loyal to his wife. Um, what else did I want to say about his wife? Uh, yeah, so it, it's, it's obvious, you know, one of the things is, so did Tyrell even care about his wife? Does he care about his son? It's obvious he does, which I think will be the powder keg because it's already demonstrated that he's a little bit unstable, that... And given the isolation and he feels that he's not getting this, the recognition recognition for his part in all of this, and particularly the planning of stage two by the Dark Army, and even to some extent Elliot, that when he does find out that his wife is dead and that his son is in child services or somewhere else, he is going to explode, really. And we see some hints to that, like his temper, if you will. So there, he's there four days alone and Dark Army shows up again. So it's four days after the hack has happened. Irvin shows up with the two Dark Army guys. The Dark Army guys, I don't want to say Irvin, it's actually another guy. The tar, tar, two Dark Army guys are sitting there with their mask on watching an old 80s uh, television show called Mask, which I thought was very amusing. It took me a little bit to recognize the TV shows. Like, I've seen that, seen that, seen that, seen that before and I had to go online to look to see if someone else recognized it and it was Mask, which is just a little inside joke, I guess you can say. And in the kitchen where there's somebody fiddling around, which I think um, is uh, actually played by Wal Wallace Shawn. We don't get his name. A great character actor known from The Princess Bride um, and some other movies and stuff. You've probably seen him before. Um, he has this kettle that is um, boiling water and it's um, boiling is going off in the steam and it makes me think um, as we talk about another set of questions being asked by somebody to someone else by the Dark Army that there might have been some drugs in the steam or whatever. Um, you actually see Wallace's character sniffing looks like cocaine but it could be just an immunity to the steam that's going on in the in the room and he tells Tyrone Wellick to sit down and he's saying, you know, you know, we need to get back on the plan. I need to talk to Elliot. And Mr. Wallace says, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about where Elliot is in a moment, but we need to ask you questions before we bring you in on this. And so Tyrone Wellick sits down and he's asked these five questions repeatedly over and over again. Um, what is it? Oh, yeah. Um, did you kill Sharon Knowles? And Tyra, that's the first question. Tyra was like, no. Do you love your wife? Um, and he's like, yes. Have you slept with someone other than your wife? And he's like, no. Um, and as he's doing this, like when he's lying, um, um, the, the Wallace's character, he's like, don't look away from me, like yelling at him. Um, will you be loyal to me? Um, were you fired from E Corp? 
Are you afraid of becoming your father? Do you hate your father? And he asks these questions over and over and over again for a period of time until eventually he starts breaking down and starts telling the truth. Like he did murder Sh uh, Sharon Knowles. He does love his wife. Um, he does acknowledge that he slept with somebody else. Um, you know, did you cheat on your wife? I think was one of the questions. And he keeps saying no. Which, you know, given the, the nature of the relationship, you know, it wasn't. He didn't cheat. His wife knew he's with other people. That was basically his job to move forward. So he wasn't cheating. She knew about it. Um, will you be loyal to me? Which is a lie, which is, yes, he says yes, but that's not true. Um, were you afraid, fired from E-Corp? He eventually says yes. Are you afraid of becoming your father? He says yes. Do you hate your father? Yes. And it seems like even though he's answering his questions eventually truthfully, um, he's not passing their little tests, unlike Angela, who did pass the test, I guess. And um, the, the henchman, whose name hasn't been revealed, uh, at least in show, I know it's on IMDb, but until they say it on show, I you can't trust IMDb. He walks in, and um, while Sean's character, who's asking these questions, looks at him and shakes his head, no, like, you, you can't work with this guy, basically. And then um, he he turns away to indicate, like, an indication that he's probably going to tell the two henchmen to come and get rid of Tyra Wellick. And Tyra Wellick says that, no, he won't be loyal to E Corp, but he will always be loyal to Elliot. And um, the attache, White Rose's attache, hears that and gives a nod that, yeah, we'll work with him. And so, well, the Sean character is basically, okay, so this is what we're going to do. Everything you need is going to be brought here. Um, you'll have a satellite phone that we control, a satellite um, to get connections and working and work in and out. Um, you listen to know that Ellie is actually in prison, um, but they're working to get him to release. And to get back to that, um, when White Rose was told that Elliot um, got caught and was got arrested, we see this, the arresting moment, uh, Dark Army was watching him get arrested and saying that, you know, they weren't able to intercept because it happened so quickly and that Elliot actually pled guilty and that he's been sentenced to eight months in prison. And White Rose was like, um, we'll see who's on our payroll, let's get him a release, talk to our inside man to make sure he greets him um, at the prison, which is Leon. So Leon, you know, we know is Dark Army. He, he pretty much said as such in second season. He does meet up with Irvin, uh, I guess the following days after. Um, Ellie's encounter with the neo-Nazis and Leon's like, yeah, you know, everything went great. I got to kill some neo-Nazis. You know, I don't like murder or anything, but it was kind of fun. And <laughs> Irvin's looking at him like he's crazy. Like, why are you telling me you committed murder in this open place? He goes, did he, did he get the, oh yeah, he got the letter. He's good. He's ready to go. But, you know, you should give him weight. He's all uh, really wound up tight and stuff. <laughs> Irvin's looking at Leon like he's super crazy. Working a lot of crazy people there, Irvin. Um, so, Elliot's, you know, this is occurring during the time that Elliot, I think it's like a three-month span that Elliot's in the prison system. And Tara Wellick is sitting there figuring out how to work stage two. So he has a map. He's doing all the research. He's figuring out how um, everything is moving, who's in charge. Um, pretty much coming up with the whole bomb using the generator, you know, taking off the generator and the UFC um, things that Elliot is trying to protect from exploding. Um, figuring out the malware, inserting it so that they can blow up the building, you know, making sure the recovery, recovering goes, everything goes to that building and then poof, blowing it up and destroying basically e evil corp and so as Tyrell Wellick is figuring this all out figuring out the plan he's getting a little frustrated Irvin's there every once in a while to check up on him and Irvin suggests that he goes outside get some get some air Tyrell Wellick's like you know I need to get back to work I need to get back on your plan and Irvin's like you need to you need to relax dude basically and it's like you know chop some wood you know chop some block of wood and he's trying to show him and then um as Irvin goes and picks up another block of wood, Tyra Wellick picks up the axe, and at first I thought he was going to whack um, Irvin, but obviously he didn't, but maybe at least make an attempt of it, and uh, he starts smacking these woods like it's nothing, and Irvin's like impressed, he goes, okay, it's like, so you've done this before, and he goes, why, you know, why did you stop, and Tyra Wellick's like, I hated it, he goes, well, good, you know, he needs a way to get his frustrations out, and as he's further in his isolation and stuff, um, you know, he slowly 
he's changing, you know, he's by himself, working solely on this plan. He's getting a little frustrated because he's not with Elliot. They need to get together. Things need to happen soon. He's getting frustrated with Irvin because he keeps telling him that him and Elliot are going to get together, be reunited. And he's getting frustrated with the fact that, you know, again, he sees his, he sees his son, but his wife is, you know, maybe seeing somebody else, divorcing him. Things are kind of disintegrating at home. Um, so he eventually decides he's going to leave. He takes the plan. He's going to still work on the plan, but he doesn't want to work on it there. And that's when he gets caught, as I talked about with Santiago. Um, he eventually gets back to the cabin. Irvin's there. He starts talking to him. And Irvin's telling him a story about how he messed up in his life and how he had, you know, has two sons and a wife. And he was eventually able to fix things and become come back and be a provider. And he, when he leaves here, he's going to go home and his kids are going to greet him and welcome him home. And he's going to sit down and watch Big Brother with his sons. And then one day, you know, Tyrell Wellick is going to do the same thing. He's going to be greeted by his wife and son in, you know, admiration, and they're going to be together, and it's all a lie, basically, you know, we find out a little bit later, um, as a way of kind of connecting and reassuring Tyra, but like, oh, sorry, but, um, we know this is a lie, because when Irvin does leave there, and he goes back to actually, um, what is not a lie is Irvin does own a uh, used car sales lot and one of his salesperson people uh, wasn't able to sell a car and he has this coffee mug that says you know the number one dad um, which is something he's been drinking at like tea or whatever the entire time he's with Tyra Willock and he uses it and points it to his um, salesperson and goes look you need to relate to people you need to connect to them look at this I have the number one dad and the guy goes you have no kids exactly they look at this and they see that I'm you know a father I, you know I'm so proud of it I'm the corny guy and this going around walking around the number one dad dad um mug you know you gotta make them believe what you're selling buy them what you're selling you know make the sale and um, when he does come home you see all these different types of mugs with all these different types of sayings on it you know bacon lovers different things that i guess he uses as a social engineering technique to get people to buy what he's selling and he's sitting there and he's writing his novel and he's watching big brother which is very amusing like you know we know that he is a used car salesman um that he is writing a novel and then he watched big brother that night um but eventually you know Ali does get out and he gets released and when tyra wellick finds that out he has like this big big ass smile like he's so relieved that he's finally going to get reunited with Elliot. Um, he expressed his frustration when he was making the Fintum cell, like if he and Elliot were in this the same room together, they, that this would have been done months ago. Um, he's a little bitter, a little frustrated by the delays that have been happening. Um, so he gets taken back to the city, uh, he gets into this hotel, um, Irvin tells him he has to stay out of sight, uh, if he needs anything, you know, just call for room service and be given to him. Um, Tyra Bullock, you know, he's a bit snooty kind of guy, it's like, you know, where's my suit? Irvin's type, you know, it's not a good idea to have the suit. And he goes, it's non-conditional. And he goes, it's in, it's in the closet. So they do allow for, um, you know, Tyra Wallet to get his suit. And um, he shaves. He's been growing a beard um, while he was in his cabin. He shaves his beard. He's all clean cut. Puts his suit on. He gets ready. Um, he's going to meet Elliot. And there's going to be a notification. And Elliot... He's going to meet Elliot in the car. Um, there already is a predestinated location where when Irvin took him into the city where um, the warehouse that we're going to work out of to work on stage two. Um, again, Tyra Wilk has a, um, a big smile on his face and he goes, yeah, Elliot's going to love this place. And so they go to that location and then we get the kind of like blackout and then, you know, you see Tyra Wilk freaking out because, you know, he shot Elliot. He's like, I don't understand. I don't understand. He's like, he looked at me like I was, uh, he's telling the standard, like, I wasn't there. I wasn't real. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. He's trying to figure out. He's a smart guy. He's trying to figure it out. That's when Angela revealed, you know, he sometimes can be a different person. He's so everything's going to be okay. He's like, this is not the best place for him. It's not sanitary. You know, he, is he going to be well? And, um, you know, she's trying to calm him down. Angela's like, let me speak to him first. He probably shouldn't see you at, at first. And then, you know, you know, basically reassuring him that everything's going to be okay. Um, and so Tyra Wallach is sitting down and he looks across and Elliot is waking up from surgery. 
and you see not Elliot waking up, but Mr. Robot waking up, and Tyrell's like looking at him like, like you almost see the different person that Elliot is. And so that we're there with that. Um, there's another thing that did happen that kind of explains some of Tyrell's behavior um, early on in the conversation that he and um, basically Mr. Robot had in the Fun Society um, as Tyra Wellick is defending himself saying after he almost got shot and killed by Mr. Robot that um, you know he almost declared his love for Elliot and Mr. Robot's like you know things are better to be subtext like I think he's aware that Tyra Wellick is in love with him and stuff but he, he's not reciprocating back and so that kind of hints you know where his wanting to be reunited with Elliot, um, his commitment to Elliot, um, his grooming himself to make himself look the best for Elliot, the best location, everything, you know, his best worker, but whatever you you will on this project, is because of his love for Elliot, um, love for his, for him as a person. He thinks he's you know the the greatest thing ever, really, particularly with the fact that they he thinks that he and Elliot are gone. So you figure out what the above is that they're got. They're gonna make this whole new world with the destruction of Evil Corp, something that they can control. And this is where Mr. Robot's like, you know, your Looney Tunes and stuff. And so it would be interesting to see, you know, when the Joanne Wellick revolution happens, when Tyra Wellick realizes a little bit more that Elliot is maybe two different people or not quite straight with him, what that does and even a little bit to the hint of Angela's relationship to Elliot more than that there might be some jealousy anger and betrayal going on there um, what that can do um, to the stage two plan so that is pretty much the episode I think they covered a lot of ground there we know that Tower Wellick is part of the architecture of stage two he helped program the phantom cell dark army is really everywhere Santiago is in on it Darlene and Dom are their days I think are numbered we know what the number is it's 11 days um, to see whether or not they're going to survive through those 11 days will be interesting to see um, I think it's to some extent Elliot's days are number as well um, as soon as stage 2 goes off if White Rose has her away you know Elliot's going to be done for so is Tyrell Wellick but it'll be interesting to see you know as we go forward as we're back into the present if you will what happens in these 11 days right before the UN vote? Or, you know, are they, is Elliot going to be successful in stopping stage two? Is Tyra Wellick going to be successful in enacting stage two, uh, along with White Rose? And there's like a lot of balls and a lot of layers up in the air. Um, we still haven't seen, you know, where Trenton and Moby are. Uh, we know they're Leon met them last season, but they haven't shown up yet yet so maybe they'll show up for you know four or five episodes there's not that many episodes this season i think it's nine or ten episodes so the clock is ticking on that um i think dom's gonna figure out the san diego is an agent of the dark army she's too smart not to have noticed or figured it out she's already a little suspicious of san diego with the direction he's taking the investigation so it'll be interesting to see like what um threads she pulls upon but overall, I like. I really super enjoyed this episode. Like I said, it's very introspective. They did keep kind of the horror aspect, the tension, if you will, like um, you know, alone in the cabin, the isolation, what it does, and making a person crazy, if you will, kind of shining, if you like, you know, the isolation of Jack, Jacks. I forgot what the last name of that character from the Stephen King book. I think it's like Jack Terror or whatever. How he went mad, madness for the isolation. He was already mad, but he went further mad, further crazy. So we have Elliot and Mr. Robot, two already unstable people. We have uh, Tara Wellick, who is unstable. And then you have, I want to say White Rose is unstable, but making a very irrational decision with the stage two and acting it still um, going on here. And so you have like these three very unstable, um, motivated for different purposes. I think it's going to intersect and clash very soon. And then you have still have like the FBI and Dom and all this mix. So, we'll see what happens. Um, overall, like I said, I really enjoyed the episode. I think it's the best so far this season. Not the best of the series, but the, so far the best this season. So that's it. Um, thank you very much for listening. I am logging off for now. And until next time, friends.